Hello, and welcome back to Eric Likes Animals. I'm your host, Eric Mahan. Thank you guys so much for listening. Before we get into today's species of the day, a bird that looks like it's about to tell you a joke or murder you in your sleep, we're going to talk a little bit about another conservation topic, coal. Coal, the thing that parents threaten you with if you're bad before Christmas that Santa will bring you even going so far as to pretend when you're extra bad that they're calling Santa to encourage him to bring you coal. And then on Christmas Day, when nothing is there, acting like a middle manager everywhere. Oh, it's not my fault. Santa's the one who decided not to bring you coal. Now, Timmy, I know I called him, but if I didn't call him, I would have got in trouble. Because no matter what, Santa would have found out. Because He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. And if mommy didn't tell on you, well, she wouldn't now have an iPhone 13. But the bigger thing about coal right now is it's a major conservation tipping point. It's, of course, not good. It's very bad. (laughs) It's not really great to have in the environment, but yet it's still around. And it is something that many conservationists and political advocates have been fighting over for many years. So let's dive in real quick into coal and why it seems to be so hard to transition away from. So number one is really we can't destroy coal 100% from the market just like that. I mean, a lot of people will sometimes say, oh, why are we trying to protect the coal industries when it would be like destroying Blockbuster, which got outcompeted by Netflix, the business went away. Like, what's the big deal? Uh, There's newer, more environmentally energy options out there that doesn't destroy the environment. Why can't we just let coal basically die? And the truth is, coal (laughs) is very different than the Blockbuster (laughs) industry, okay? Number one, no one created laws to destroy Blockbuster, all right, as many people are trying to advocate for to eliminate coal. And Blockbuster didn't just simply find a spot, set up shop, and a whole town grows around them, okay? That's the big difference between the coal industry and other businesses. Let's stop picking on Blockbuster for a second, okay? So coal is basically the heart to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of towns across the country. I'm from Pennsylvania, so I can speak from experience by visiting some of these towns. By getting rid of the coal industry, you would actually be killing off the town since a majority of the residents there are part of the coal mining facilities. You may ask yourself, well, why don't they just simply move? Like, you know, don't they know that they're destroying the environment? So let's dive into that real quick. You are asking hundreds and hundreds of towns to literally pack up and move. And growing up in a small town where there is a business where it feels like 60% of the population works at this business, that's pretty hard to do because you are asking the death of a town. And it's not just, for instance, the coal business, but all the little businesses that came along to be part of that town, restaurants car dealerships, um, hardware stores, all that sort of stuff. To destroy the coal industry in that town, you are thus also destroying hundreds of other businesses along with it. Now, focusing on the people themselves, I got to say, being an environmentalist for the most part, let's be real, it is a lot easier when you have a steadier paycheck, okay? Um, And not constantly worried about the job because it's very hard to think 10 years down the road when you are concerned about what's happening next week. All right. So problem number one, it's very hard for a lot of people in some of these towns that are struggling to really care about the environment when they are trying to figure out if they can eat next week. Okay. That's, that's just the gist of it. I mean, I only just finally kind of hybrid as much of an environmentalist as I like to think I am recently because Finally, there were used ones, okay? I don't have the money to go out and buy new hybrids, and I definitely don't have the money to go buy like new electric cars, okay? So for the most part, right now, being an environmentalist for a lot of places is very hard to do unless you have money, all right? So that's difficult. Also, the whole picking up and moving, what, what are these people going to do 
in that you would say, oh, well, they can sell their house and then they'd simply buy another one. But who's going to buy a house in a town that literally is dying? Okay, so where is the money for them to move? Also, for some of these people, they're living in houses that possibly their fathers, their grandfathers lived in. It's their family home. All right. So for a second, just simply think of something that is treasured to you from your family that you keep, a keepsake, something from your grandmother, grandfather, or something like that. And now imagine someone from the outside saying, oh, uh, yeah, you need to give that up and go somewhere else, you know, like give, give that up. All right. It's hurting the environment. All right. That's that's a very emotional thing to ask people to do. And now if you're saying, well, you're saying hundreds and hundreds of people like, you know, and hundreds and hundreds of towns, like really, how many people could that be? Like, I've never been to a coal town before. How many people could that possibly even incorporate? And I mean, just look at campaign ads. All right. Do you really think that politicians would really spend that much money creating ads for people like coal miners? If that wasn't a huge population of people that that would affect to vote for them. I mean, when I was in Pennsylvania, I felt like when Trump was running both times, every other ad that I saw in Pennsylvania was Donald Trump for coal miners. Okay, so clearly, if a politician is going to spend billions and billions of dollars for those ads and being so frequent, That's a huge population. Now, I just looked it up on, uh, uh, it was a news article, Philadelphia Inquirer, that it said that about 17,000 people work for the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance directly or indirectly. All right, so 17,000 people just working for this coal alliance. And that that doesn't mean that there's only 17,000 people that would be affected if these towns shut down. Because like I said, there's a ton of other businesses that would be involved with those shutdowns as well. Moving on to what we need to do. I'm sorry that this first part took so long, but I really do feel like if people felt like they walked a mile in another person's shoes more, we wouldn't have as much aggressive back and forth between each other. We need to create a situation like Blockbuster. And what I mean by that is we need to help out these towns so that they are not 100% reliant on one business. Because when Blockbuster shut down, People just simply got the job next door, probably at a Domino's, okay? So we need to create jobs in that region. And it always shocks me that for whatever reason, one of the most classic conservation methods that we have available to us that we've been doing for years and years all across the world is the concept of just simply creating new jobs and investing into the communities and showing them a different way. And what I mean by that uh, is, so for instance, there are a number of towns around the world that the majority of the money coming in was killing whale sharks. Bad. Okay. So what a lot of conservation people did is they started gaining you know, some monetary uh, stuff from donors in the U.S., And then they went to these towns and helped invest in the towns themselves and created jobs that would put monetary value on the whale sharks being kept alive and also teaching them different methods of gaining money. So sometimes there was ecotourism. That's the big one, okay? And that is simply showing how to basically (laughs) encourage rich foreigners to come out and you get to show them the whale sharks. Okay. So clearly you want whale sharks there because well, rich people come out and go swimming with whale sharks. So you want them there. Also, a lot of times these conservation groups are setting up newer schools, hospitals, things like that. And the whole reason those conservation groups are there are for the whale sharks. So they want to keep the whale shark. I mean, there's tons of examples besides whale sharks, like deforestation, showing people how to make things that Uh, burn better, brighter, and all that sort of stuff for cooking instead of going out and chopping down trees, other animals showing them ecotourism, or giving them a different avenue of revenue for that area besides having to go out and kill the animals themselves. But yet, we can't seem to transition that thought 
to people in our own country. And I don't know if it's because we feel like, well, you're an American. Clearly, you can just pick up and move. And, you know, a lot of these towns in foreign countries, like, where else are they going to move to? Like, it's the same situation everywhere. So we focus on fixing the problem at the source. Yet for people in our own country, we just tell them, hey, why don't you move? And we wonder why they hate us and why it's so much a tug of war almost between, well, the this party is in and they're going to protect coal miners and, oh, this party is in and they want to do eco. So they're trying to get rid of coal. And it's just this back and forth and back and forth because we're not offering any sort of solution for those people. Actually, even worse in that we're trying to get rid of coal mines and then the replacement energy sources like solar panels, wind turbines, and things like that, we're actually investing into other areas besides investing those new businesses back into the area that we took businesses away from. They're not going to probably protect the coal mines as much because in all honesty, no one in their own mind sees themselves as a villain. And you need to keep that in mind when talking about these situations. Environmentalists do not see themselves as a villain because they are trying to save the environment and save the future for our children. Coal miners do not see themselves as the villain because they are trying to provide for their current children this day, creating the tug of war where nobody wins. Because a conservation methodology is only as good as the execution. And just simply telling people to suck it up never worked and will never work. All right, moving on to our species of the day. Today is going to be about a bird, like I said, that both has quite a goofy smile, but also has a look that looks like it will murder you in your sleep. So without further ado, the species of the day is the shoebill stork. Now, some of you might be thinking, Dan, we have a bird species not too long ago. I do want to address the topic real quick. So we had somebody on the Facebook page that pretty much instantly guessed that it was going to be the Watson bird on episode four. So <laughs> uh, since uh, he guessed it correctly, just by kind of my little quick teaser thing, his reward was he got to choose what type of animal we were going to talk about next. And of course, since he guessed Watson so quickly, he is quite a big bird nerd. So he is very excited for more bird facts, as am I. So that is why we are doing another bird so quickly. But it is a very cool bird. So get ready. First off, the shoebill stork, also known as the whale headed stork is a species found in Africa. Specifically, it is found in the swamps and the marshes of East Central Africa, Southern Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, that kind of area. It is about 3.5 to 5 feet tall. So very, very tall bird it has an eight foot wingspan. And as big as it is, it only weighs eight to 15 pounds. The shoebill stork has been named this simply because the beak itself actually looks like kind of a Dutch clog. You know, it has the little upturned shoe uh, to it. Uh, and actually, funny enough, is really one of the main sounds it makes almost sounds like Dutch clogs kind of stomping around on wooden floor. Uh, it does this very fast beak clap to kind of attract mates. And it, to me, it sounds like people dancing real quick with clogs on wooden floors. Or it sounds kind of like a very poor attempt at somebody trying to make horse clocking sounds, you know, the uh, kind of sound <laughs> to it. That was horrible. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll take that part out. Um, anyway, so shoebill storks are definitely not a stork you <laughs> would want to deliver your baby. Most likely it would probably eat it because these guys have a pretty aggressive feeding. Uh, they have that big beak so that they can catch things and they pretty much eat fish, lizards, uh, frogs, birds, small mammals, pretty much anything that can fit into that big bill. Like I said, it is a stork, although some people have argued that it is a heron or a pelican to kind of go real quick because, I mean, I still struggle with this as well. And this is kind of how it's easy to remember herons and storks and egrets and all that sort of stuff because, I mean, for most people, it's like, well, they're just all kind of tall, skinny birds. What's the big difference? Okay, so here it is. Heron has long legs and a long neck. 
Storks have long legs and a long beak. Egrets are a type of heron, normally a white version. And cranes have a shorter neck than herons and keep them straight normally during flight. So hopefully that helps you kind of realize the difference between all these different wading birds. Okay, back to shoebill storks. They actually have become pretty popular on the internet for the most part in that the coloration and kind of the look, a lot of people compare it to Buckbeak from Harry Potter. Because of this, people kind of blew up on the internet loving the shoebill storks. So for the most part, you probably have seen them already. If not, check them out. They're really cool. They, as I said, were are found in Africa. Ancient Egyptians really loved these birds. They said that they had the power to fend off crocs, so they felt like, I guess, if shoebill storks were around, the crocs weren't around. And for the most part, that's true. They really can't go after larger crocs, but these birds are pretty badass. Like, they will eat baby crocs, and they will fend off larger crocodiles. So they, they are kind of the honey badger of the bird world in that sense. They don't give a shit. How these birds actually catch food is that they will kind of wander out into the marsh and the swamp. They will stand very still. In fact, they will stand still sometimes for hours. And they have those really, really long legs to keep their body kind of out of the water and very skinny legs. So for a fish or a lizard or anything just kind of going by, especially how still it's standing, like it's going to look like two little sticks coming out of the water to them. When a prey does come close enough to the stork, it will kind of launch itself into the water. They they call it a collapse, where a lot of egrets and stuff will kind of just kind of shoot their head down real quick and catch something. These guys, it's graceful, but not graceful all at the same time, which is kind of a good description for the shoebill stork. It's graceful, but also not graceful. So it will launch itself in the water and grab things and just gobble them up with their big beaks. Like I said, pretty much anything that can fit in their beak, and even sometimes some things a little bit bigger. Uh, Their beak and their skull is quite strong for this type of uh, fishing or hunting uh, because they are throwing a lot of force behind it. A lot of times, sometimes to stun the prey, that's how much. It's like getting punched by a rock. These birds are normally solitary. Even mated pairs will sometimes fish and kind of hang out away from each other unless it's nesting season then they kind of hang out a little bit more but let's just say they are those they're kind of like the couples that have two separate beds or even two separate bedrooms because it's like well we're a couple but we like our own separate spaces we appreciate each other we'll do some stuff together but we need our space the shoebill stork is very much that style of couple Like I said, shoebill storks will kind of clap their beaks together for a mate. Kind of sounds like, as I said, uh, someone kind of imitating horse running real quick uh, or kind of hitting two blocks of wood real quick together. But once they're a mated pair, they will build their nest on the ground and uh, sometimes in the trees. Even with their large size, they are actually still fairly good flyers. Their kind of wings are a slower beat, but it's efficient. Uh, especially with eight foot wingspan, they can definitely provide a lot of lift without exerting too much energy. Shoebills were normally lay two eggs, sometimes three, sometimes one. If they lay more than one egg, normally those eggs are laid five days apart from each other. Incubation is normally 30 days. The parents will carry water in their beaks to help cool the eggs and hatch young will also kind of get water dribbled on them as well because Don't forget, this is Africa, and in the middle of the day, it can be extremely hot. So for the most part, sometimes they're not actually laying on top of the eggs, maybe at night because it gets a little cooler, but actually they're doing the opposite of how we think of birds a lot of time, and they're actually trying to keep them cool because they don't want cooked shoebill stork eggs for breakfast. They, They want them to hatch. Parents stay cool, by the way, also for pooping on their legs, which is something pretty classic vultures do. Also, shoebill storks can keep cool by simply opening up their mouth and their upper throat muscle actually can pretty much, I don't want to say pulsate or, you know, just kind of move hot air out of them. So since they can't sweat, that's kind of their version. It's almost, 
I guess the closest thing you could consider it is like a dog panting almost, but still different. Anyway, moving back to the babies. Once those chicks hatch, however, life gets a little weird. Now, Shoebill Storks, pretty much given away with kind of those dark, scary glares, do have a bit of a dark side. And that comes when they are first born. For the most part, mom and dad can only take care of one baby. Even if there's two, even if there's three, unfortunately, really only one baby is going to be able to take care of it. Now, parents aren't really the ones to decide this because what happens is the reason why those eggs are laid five days apart from each other is you're going to have an older one and a younger one. And if there's three eggs, a younger, younger one. So that means one is further along, been getting fed more, has more energy. And a lot of time that means that it will outcompete the other chicks. Now, this is something not just in shoebill storks, a ton of birds do this, and it is basically insurance. They are guaranteeing that whichever baby is born is the strongest. It is healthy. There's no disease because if they were trying to take care of all three, but one of them just had some sort of physical problem, the other two would suffer. And they could possibly lose all three versus pretty much guaranteeing that they will have one baby survive and that it will be a very strong baby because of this. Kind of crappy, especially because normally what happens is the other baby will push the other one out of the way, it will bite and attack it, and it will literally steal food out of its mouth. So it is a pretty dark thing, but that is nature. It takes about 30 days, like I said, for incubation. It takes 95 days for the birds to fledge and then 120 days till it's independent. So they do grow up fairly quickly. Real quick, touching on the word fledge. For those that have never really heard the word fledge, when a bird fledges or when a bird fledge, it's when it gains its feathers for flying. So it's no longer the fuzzy uh, kind of little thing. Like when we refer to a fledgling, it's normally maybe the bird is starting to grow a couple little feathers, but it's still not really a bird at like it doesn't look like an adult yet. Now that doesn't mean that it has adult plumage because for example, birds like bald eagles, they will have all their feathers, but they will not have that classic white head, white tail, black body. They're actually normally brown and it takes about five years till they're sexually mature that they then start getting those mature adult feathers. And that's just kind of a quick trigger to tell other adults, hey, I'm not a competition for breeding, so I'm cool. All right, you don't need to come and defend your territory against me. I'm going to just catch a fish and move on through, okay? So feathers are pretty important for communication a lot for the birds. And so when they start getting the fledge feathers in, that's um, what we kind of refer to as when a bird fledges. Now, focusing back on, unfortunately, the dark secret, of that they will beat each other up as young. That's because it's a pretty tough world where they're, they're living in, okay? It's Africa. There is so many things that want to eat you there for a lot of different species. And you could almost consider this almost gladiators fighting off each other so that when moving on, they are the toughest and are built to survive this environment because they have to deal with crocs. They have to deal with other shoebill storks they're like, like i said even mated pairs aren't really together together they're kind of like we need our alone time we'll come together but even then we'll they'll have some squabbles so they need to be fairly tough and this is just one of many different ways that animals will ensure the survival of their offspring unfortunately as strong as they are they're still considered vulnerable by the International United Conservation for Nature, IUCN. You could also look up Red List, which is their version of kind of telling you what's in danger, what's vulnerable. And it's just a group that looks over basically all the different animals around the world. And well, actually, scratch that, not just animals, but they also will look at um, plants. So they're, they're looking at all species, really. And for the shoebill stork, 
they consider them vulnerable. Uh, there is currently 3,300 to 5,300 adults in the wild. So the main conservation issues that these birds are having to deal with is the loss of habitat to farming, ranching, oil and gas companies, pollution, fire, and yes, even wildlife trafficking. Because going back to what I said at the beginning, they were a bit of an internet sensation. And unfortunately for most wild species, that's not good. So one of the big issues, of course, being an internet sensation is animal trafficking. People are spending so much money just to get these birds because people want to feel like they have a buck beak in their backyard. And then they get them and they realize that these guys are pretty big assholes. But that's not the point because the point is that people are spending all this money to go out who have no sort of experience and spend a lot of money to take a bird out of the wild just because they want some cool topic of interest living in their backyard, okay? So that is um, one of the main reasons why these internet sensation animals, such as otters and slow loris and all that, like, it's great, but yeah, no. So just remember that before you hit like on the next kind of animal super viral video, okay? Like, Make sure you think about the impacts that adding more fuel to the fire of that specific video would cause. Is it a recordable zoo and that they're just showing off a cool conservation project or new sort of breeding success? Or is it some guy with a pet otter in a bathtub? You decide. As for the conservation of the shoebill stork, it's very much like I talked about in the coal section, talking about how conservation groups are trying to put a value on the animals to stay there. They are creating jobs for locals for different conservation and protection jobs around the breeding habitats of the shieldbill stork, as well as ecotourism. Making sure this bird that looks like Big Bird's evil twin, here to stay. Thank you guys so much for listening once again. I'm Eric Mahan. This is Eric Likes Animals. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Facebook so you can get more about the animals and different conservation topics that we talk about, as well as possibly winning the reward of choosing our next topic. I'm Eric Mahan. Thank you guys for listening so much. See you guys next time. See ya.